Welcome everybody to week three, day one. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the principles of game design. And the game you're going to review is Relecta, which is available on Epic Game Store for free for the next two days. So make sure you get it done um, ASAP, or um, I guess you, you have to buy it, so get it for free. So uh, game design principles are really important. And um, a lot of people just kind of make, like make a game like sort of haphazardly, like they'll sort of, I don't know, they, they've got an idea for doing like a submarine game and they just sort of like make a submarine and they kind of pilot it around and shoot torpedoes at ships and they're like, all right, this is fun. And, and they don't really think too deliberately about it. And, and that's a problem because um, when you make games, you need to be actually very thoughtful and deliberate with the design decisions you make. Is this going to be a single-player submarine game, or is it going to be a multiplayer submarine game? You need to decide that at the beginning. If you just kind of slap multiplayer on at the end, you get something like uh, Mass Effect uh, Two or Mass Effect Three, where they have this really hokey, um, they have this really hokey multiplayer system, and they sort of integrate it with the single-player world, but not really. And they have loot boxes, and it was just this terrible addition to what was otherwise, you know, probably a pretty good game other than the ending. So we're going to talk today about the principles of game design, concepts in game design that make games fun, that make games interesting, and that you need to think about when you design a game, because remember you're going to be doing a mod in a, in a game by the end of the by the end of the semester, both my 50A and 50B people. And so uh, 50B people, you might have heard this lecture before, but it's still going to be good for you. At some point I'm probably going to split you off and um, give you your own lectures uh tonight this afternoon of course you get your own uh but like thank you for coming to these and at some point i'm gonna figure out a, a better way of, of doing this but it's still probably good for you to, to go over this again so uh there is a uh there is this thing called the handbook of uh, game design mechanics or something like that that goes over game design handbook yeah, handbook of game design there it is um, is that it? It just looks like a random book. Um, might not be the same one, but it doesn't matter. The point is, is that there is, uh, across, you know, the centuries, people have been making games. And it's a really interesting question as to what makes games fun. Last week I talked about why I found Europa Universalis fun. And you probably have your own opinions on if it's fun or not and it might very well not be fun for you and that's fine but you all have your own games that you find to be fun like guild wars or destiny 2 or or whatever and um none of you know like destiny 2 wasn't an accident like i don't find it to be a fun game i'm, I'm gonna be honest with you like uh you know alex like i i i it, i'm sort of yeah, I, I yeah I played it, but it's like, uh, like I, I don't like it, but it's not an accident, right? It's not, it's not like Destiny Two just was like some people just like threw some stuff together into a blender and and Destiny Two popped out. Like it, like the people at at Bungie have been making high quality games since the mid to early nineties, right? Like they've got collectively you know, 30, 40 years of experience per person if they've been there since the beginning. Like, they know what they're doing, you know. And even though I don't like the game, like, I still respect their uh, ability to make games. Let's put it that way. And and to tell stories and, and things like that as well. So, um, <clears throat> so if you want to be a, a game designer, if you want to make games, and you're, you're not just, like, taking this class to cross off some, you know, credit requirement or something you need in which case yeah you should probably listen to this lecture anyway because uh, it might help you be a little bit more thoughtful about games when you play games uh, when when you make a game you need to be really really thoughtful about the decisions you make going into it and single player versus multiplayer is obviously one of them and it's a very important one you know can you, can you imagine how different destiny 2 would be if it was a single player game like how, how do you think it would be alex if it was a single player game would it be better or would it be worse? It'd be boring. Why? Because you don't have anybody to talk to. Can't you like I don't know, talk to people on Discord while uh, 
Do you play a single player Destiny? I mean, you know, is it just the social aspects that, that make it interesting? Uh, you play because of the people you meet? Okay. Rating? So, I mean, you, you could have a one player rate, right? It's just a, a very difficult single player dungeon. You know, wh why do you why do you need to have, you know, multiple people in Destiny 2? Like what, what, like, what about the game design makes it actually necessary for the game to work for there to be multiple people? The game mechanics, okay? Well, what, what in particular? Like, you know, there are solo flawless challenges, okay? So they, the, so they do have some solo challenges, okay? But, you know, the main game, right, is multiplayer. So what, what about the game mechanics make it require, like, do you, do you, do you see what I'm getting at? Like, you know, it's not an accident that it's a multiplayer game, like, their design decisions are built around um, multiplayer, right? Like um, to stand on a plate to open a door. Okay, but like, what about what about the game mechanics? Like Pat has said, the game mechanics are multiplayer. How do the game mechanics of different players interact with each other? Give me an example. Don't be afraid to talk about your Sunfist or Warlock or whatever. Um, like what? What about the game mechanics? Inherently makes the game multiplayer. Like I was just playing a game with uh, a friend of mine a week or two ago, called Across the Obelisk, and uh, this game here is a multiplayer version of Slay of the Spire. And um, that said, inherently it's not exactly a multiplayer game. You can play it single player. You just end up controlling all four characters, or you can play with up to four people, and each person controls one character. But the reason why I think it's sort of inherently a multiplayer game is because um, it takes a really long time to like manage a deck. It's a, it's a deck building game and you have to pull cards out and upgrade cards and, and things like that. Um, if you have to do that for four decks, it takes forever. Even with my friend Zach, who um, apparently has been playing a lot more than me now, he's uh, maybe in it right now, or no, he's sleeping, never mind. Um, he was managing two and I was managing two and it still took us like six hours to beat the game to do a single run because we're sitting sitting there spending so much time reading things and looking at upgrading and, and stuff like that. So so that element of it, you can see that like it was designed from the ground up to be a, a multiplayer game. Um, uh, you, you liked uh, Across the Obelisk? Yeah, it's, it's, it's fantastic. I, I, I'm, I, it, for being an early access game, like I'm, I'm very impressed by it. Less us to worry about. You need to communicate to make sure you flop the battle. Yeah, yeah, it's it's good. Like, okay, I'm gonna do this. You know, hey, do you need extra energy? Yeah, I'm gonna need two. Yeah, okay, here you go. You know, um, you guys still haven't answered the question. Like, why why is why is Destiny two multiplayer? Like, how did they bake into the classes multiplayer? You guys know what I'm getting at? Like in Team Fortress two, let me give you an example. Team Fortress two is inherently a multiplayer game. Team Fortress 2 would make no sense as a single-player game. It's called Team Fortress, right? Uh, for those of you that don't know Team Fortress, um, there it's a class-based team uh, shooter, first-person shooter. And so these are the different classes you can play as. You can play as a sniper, an engineer, a pyro, heavy weapon, sky spy, etc., etc. Uh, the medic, for example, is an example of how multiplayer is baked into the system, the medic, exists to heal other people. The medic would make no sense as a single-player character, right? I, I've played the medic in single-player, like, um, um, where you, like, run through Quake um, single-player. I've done it as the medic, uh, just as, like, a challenge, but there's no point, like, because you can't heal other people, right? So, Team Synergy, yeah, yeah. So, um... The soldier is probably the closest thing to like a solo character, right? They just run around with a rocket launcher and shoot people. Like, it, like the the soldier is basically the Quake soldier from the the Quake character from Quake from the original Quake. Because in Quake Deathmatch, your goal is usually to get the rocket launcher and then run around exploding people. And you, you get red armor, you get the rocket launcher, you run around and kill people in Deathmatch. That's Quake Deathmatch. And so the the soldier in Team Fortress is literally that guy. You start with red armor, the best armor. In the game, second only to the heavy weapons guy, you get a rocket launcher to begin with, and you're literally just like a free for all person. Everybody else um, 
is is there is something to do with teamwork built into them. The engineer is used to shut down, uh, you know, entryways into your base. Uh, pyros are used for holding quarters. Um, heavy weapons guys are used for, uh, you know, also suppression and things like that. Spies obviously don't make any sense in a single player game, right? If it was free for all, the spy would make no sense for whatsoever because you see the spy and you're like, oh, you kill him, you know. He's on my team because I have no team. You, get, you, get, you guys get what I'm getting at? Uh, the demolitions guy can set traps, you know, and and protect protect your doors and things like that by setting traps. The medic obviously heals other people, and the scout is designed to sn uh, run really quickly into enemy bases and get the flag and bring it back to yours. And the rest of the team's job is kind of to stop their scouts and help your scouts get into their base and capture the flag, right? So with the exception of the soldier, who really is just a single-player first-person shooter character, uh, all of them have team play baked into the design of the game. And, um, again, it's not an accident. Like, um, Team Fortress 2, which is what everybody thinks of as Team Fortress these days, was uh, the third iteration of the game they made. And so it's a refined um, gameplay, right? It was based on Team Fortress Classic, which was based on Team Fortress 1. Uh, so, um, you know, Robin and the rest of the guys, you know, have been you know, doing this since 96, so 26 years now, something like that. They've been doing Team Fortress, so they have refined the gameplay. Okay. Um, was this game influential on the industry? Team Fortress? Yes. Uh, Team Fortress inspired a game called Counter-Strike, um, which you might have heard of. Um, Team Fortress was the biggest mod, really, for Quake, and then for Half-Life 1, and then Counter-Strike was a Half-Life 1 mod. Gooseman, the guy that um, made Counter-Strike, uh, I knew him back in the Team Fortress days, and I actually offered to help him on, on Counter-Strike, and he turned me down um, when we were just chatting on a channel together. Because uh, I was I was fairly, I was not famous, but like reasonably famous as a modder of, of Team Fortress. Because I made custom Team Fortress, where you can build your own custom class, and Counter-Strike was very similar to that. Like, his design, I'm not saying he copied me, but his design was pretty damn similar to mine. You know, you have a budget, and you use that budget to purchase weapons, you know. His design wasn't as... Um, his design was a lot more limited, right? Like, mostly you purchase weapons with the money you have in, uh, in Counter-Strike. I think you could buy armor and a helmet as well back then. I don't know if you still can. Um... But in uh, in custom Team Fortress, you can buy not only weapons, but the ability to like disguise yourself like a spy, to build a sentry gun like the engineer and things like that. So in a certain sense, you know, Counter Strike was a slimmed down, refined version of uh, Team Fortress and custom Team Fortress. I, I don't know to what extent my mod had on him, but um, the uh, you know it was for Half Life, and his his innovation was doing things like being able to shoot through doors. So if there was a closed door. You could shoot through it. And so if somebody is defending on the other side, the attackers can actually shoot through the door and kill the people on the other side. That was that was a big advancement that he made. Another advancement that he made was the notion of hostages. And so the uh, the terrorists have a, bu a bunch of hostages. The counter-terrorists are trying to come in and escort the hostages back to their starting point. That's the whole point of Counter-Strike. It, it evolved since then to like defusing bombs and, and things like that. But... Um, and you can always just kill everybody on the other team, but the the base mechanic was uh, a team a team base, right? Like you work as a team to get in, get the hostages, and get them out. You don't have to kill the other team, right? And so you can do distractions and things like that, like send people over here, and then they go rushing over there, and you sneak in and get the hostages out. You know that's that's what made Counter Strike fun at the beginning. So weapons and grenades, yeah. Uh, can you buy like Kevlar in uh, in Counter Strike? I, I have not actually played CSGO. Like, I played a lot of Counter-Strike back in the day and sort of... Uh, sort of have no desire to ever play it again. <laughs> do, 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 do. Yeah, you can buy armor. Okay. Yeah, so it's still the same then. Okay. So, um... Yeah, so... Pata, Alex, tell me, like, what in Destiny 2 has this sort of thing 
baked into it, like we're talking about with Counter Strike, Team Fortress, Custom Team Fortress, you know, Team Fortress Two. Like, what? How is how is multiplayer baked into the classes of of Destiny Two? All right, the Ward of Dawn. All right, so what what does the Ward of Dawn do for you? I know you don't really have interest in Diablo 2, or Diablo 2, <laughs> Destiny 2, uh, but you should look at some of the raid mechanics. Okay, just tell me about it. Just tell me about it. It's fine. It's like, what is what is the Award of Dawn do? And how does this, how does this support uh, team play? It blocks all damage for your team, right? It's an area effect damage blocking, yeah. And so you, you fire it off and then people huddle inside of it, right? To avoid to avoid damage. Is that that basically the 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 upshot of it? Nerf the bubble. Severely overpowered. Titans make some good shields and warlocks can heal and boost and hunters can roll around and just roll around and slide, yeah. So yeah, that, that's kind of what I was getting at. Was that the um, there's there's like what three classes and then each class has what three subclasses, something like that. It's been a while since I played it. Yeah, there's three classes and then what is where are the where are the subclasses? There was an error. Good job, Google. Stormcaller, Dawnblade, Voidwalker. Are there more? Okay. There's four now? Okay. So there's essentially 12 classes grouped into three archetypes. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah. And so basically they build into like the Warlock, the ability to heal your teammates. And uh, the Fighter class has the ability to tank and protect and things like that. And that's that's... Kind of what I'm getting at, like the, um, the 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 choice of it being multiplayer wasn't just like an accidental add-on. Like you know, it wasn't like they were 90% of the way through development. And they're like, hey, you know, it'd be cool if Destiny was like multiplayer. You know, like that that wasn't like an afterthought. Like it was built into the design mechanics from the beginning. Like you, got, you guys nod. Like you guys, yeah, you understand what I'm saying here. Like it's a deliberate decision, and um, like <laughs> yeah. It's not like they're just like slapping things together, you know. Although, it, although to us sometimes it, it feels that way, right? Like the local, you know. I, I don't know about Destiny too, but sometimes like Path of Exile, which I played a, a lot of, a new patch would come out, and you're just like, "What the hell were they thinking?" <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> all right. I mean, you can release this, and I'm sure it's going to get nerfed. But in the meantime, I'm going to go and explode every monster in a single hit on the entire screen. You know, um, so. Yeah, but but overall, like you know, they they test and they were fine. If you've ever looked at, have you guys played Halo? Uh, any of the Halo games? Oh, Meredith, you're with us now. Excellent. All of them, yeah, all. Um, so three four three uh, took over from Halo uh, from from Bungie, right? Um, uh, was it fifteen years ago? Wow, it's been that long. Okay, so. Um, I feel old now. Halo Reach was, was it really 15 years ago? 12 years ago. Okay. All right. Still pretty bad. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so if, if you go onto, like, uh, YouTube, you can actually see how 343 does, like, their level design and things like that. Um, 343 Halo level. So, so this, uh, I'll pop the link on the chat there. Um, it's, it's really interesting to see how they go about doing this. And, and this is actually going to be one of the assignments for the 50B people. So for uh, Corrente and Stover, um, that's actually going to be your next homework assignment. Is uh, you're going to go through that design process that I just, I posted right there. Okay. I want you to do that in Unreal Engine. I want you to make a multiplayer map. It doesn't have to be super big or detailed or complex, but I want you to do 
what's called gray boxing and white boxing and things like that where you just kind of sketch out the flow of a map and I want you to make a two-person capture the flag style team fortress map okay and think about the flow of the, the of the world and if you look at that video you can see how 343 goes about refining over and over and over again their maps it, and that might explain why there aren't very many of them <laughs> you know because it's a it's a tremendous uh, effort for them to make a map they put so much time into uh, roughing it roughing it out and then playing it and, and when they uh, have you guys heard that term before like gray boxing uh, so it's it's like you make a map that without without textures or anything on it you know you just kind of you know, you just kind of rough it out, you know, you don't, you don't bother with like making it all pretty and putting, putting, um, you know, all the details and stuff and you just kind of rough it out. And so what they do is, um, is they, uh, they make a rough draft of a map and then they go and they play in it. Right. So they'll run around and, um, shoot each other and stuff like that. And then they find out okay this map sucks because there's one way into the base and everybody on the other team will just camp it and they will kill you when you come in and they always permanently have a shield up behind it so you can't kill them and it's stupid and so then they um modify it right and so this is kind of what i want you guys to do in the 50b people right uh, so rather than one control point i want there to be two flags and i want you to think about the flow through a map so uh, this is Overwatch. So one team spawns here. I know which you guys know which map this is, by the way. And one team spawns here, and they've got different routes to get to the map. And basically, they'll they'll meet in the middle and they'll fight. And you want to make the maps interesting, and you want to make them fair. Okay. Um, so um, so 50B people, what I want you to do is to gray box a. Uh, a two-player capture the flag style map okay giant boxes things like that and just run through it and I don't know record a video or whatever and and show me show you show me your map and then I will give you feedback on it I will tell you if it's a good map or not it's one of the nice things about having two people in the class is you get a lot of attention and so I want you to actually think critically and think hard about what makes for a good two team map two team capture the flag map uh, Think about choke points. If there's a single doorway into the flag room, that will become a choke point and the team will focus their defenses there. So having alternate routes is usually um, a good a good idea to get around choke points. Um, and, uh, and just kind of sketch out like the main path that you think that somebody will take to get to the other base and always have kind of like an alternate to get around. Like maybe they can jump in the water and swim and take a ladder up the side or something like that. You know what I mean? So that if, if it gets too hot or or too well defended on one route, then you have an alternate way of getting getting around, which is how most um, which is how most levels are designed. You have uh, here's two forts in Team Fortress Two. You've got the bridge, which is the only land way across the enemy map. But if it's too hot, there's too many enemy people on that side. You can jump in the water and swim underneath their base, right? And uh, to get into their base, there's two doorways, but they both connect on the back side, so it's like really one entrance. But if you're a soldier, you could rocket jump up to the sniper nest and then come in that way. All right, so they provide alternate means of entry and things like that. So, um, you guys understand? 50B people, I want you to. Or uh, one of one of the one of the bullet points of learning in 50B is is map design. Okay, so. Um, so watch that video. So it's a good video. And 58 people, you can watch that video too. It's it, it's really interesting to watch how people who really know their trade go about crafting and refining and, and things like that. So they'll they'll make change. Sometimes they'll discard a map entirely. They don't like doing that because it wastes all their time. But sometimes you're like, yeah, this just isn't going to work. But usually they'll like move things around and like, okay, let's put a ladder up this way because you know. And and then they they after they've finished playing playing it and play testing it then they'll start putting in details and adding in textures and things like that and, and then they play it more and and then they finally have the final map and they you know beta test it and you know that's that's what a lot of game um design is about it's about just iterating play testing and refining so a friend of mine is um 
a professional game de de designer. Uh, they're developing a new game right now. I don't know anything about it. He's under he's under an NDA. Uh, I had him come and talk uh, to this class about a year ago. He couldn't tell us what it was about, but apparently it's about to go into alpha testing, and he's accepted me into the alpha pet in, into the alpha test. And if you guys are interested, I could ask him if um, if he will take some of you guys as well, and maybe we can make it like a um, homework assignment to alpha test a new game by a guy who worked for a Nintendo on a little franchise called. Pokemon. He worked for Wizards of the Coast on something called Magic the Gathering. He was the guy who invented Magic the Gathering Arena, apparently. Or, you know, I don't know if invented is the right word, but, uh, yeah. So, uh, and he's, he's a awesome dude. He's, he's a very cool dude. I'm a, I'm a big fan. He's a friend of mine. I've stayed at his house before. Um, uh, this guy. So, not that guy, this guy. So, um, excellent storyteller and uh, all around good guy. So, I'll see if, uh, I'll see if uh, I can get you guys into the alpha test as well. I'll ask him. Worst he can say is no. Actually, the worst he can say is, go away, never be my friend again. <laughs> yeah. But I'll, I will risk that for you guys. I'll put my friendship on the line for my class. I'm kidding. So, all right, so let's talk about the principles of game design. Um, so I've put together this thing called the game analysis form. And the game analysis form is something you'll be filling out uh, repeatedly this semester because uh, ludology, the study, the scientific study of games, uh, I don't know how scientific it is, but the study, the academic study of games is one of the things we will be uh, coming back to and having talks on. And, and I, I always like it when you guys talk back to me so it's not just me being like Destiny 2 has three classes right like is you know it's been years since I played it I don't know you know I I, I want you guys to inter interact with me you know especially because there's only you know five people in the class so uh, the game analysis forum uh, Destiny 2 go burr <laughs> yeah if Meredith was here uh, uh, earlier you're, you're here now uh, we would have used Guild Wars 2 because I played that game also briefly you know so please feel free to correct me like um, Counter-Strike I haven't played since the 90s. Let's put it that way. Like, I played a lot of it in the 90s, and then it was just, like, done. You know? Kind of like Overwatch. Like, I got up to, like, level 100 in Overwatch, and I'm like, that's good enough. That <laughs> That's enough Overwatch for me, and I quit playing it. Exa the day that I hit 100, I'm like, boom, uninstall. That <laughs> That's it for Overwatch. So... Uh, the how long does it take to complete Subnautica? So if you have not played Subnautica one, I wouldn't start with Subnautica two. Subnautica two has more crafting options, the graphics are a little better, but Subnautica one is a masterpiece of game design. Subnautica two is just kind of like, hey, you guys like Subnautica one? We're just gonna make like a, you know, get new game mode plus kind of thing for you. You know, it's it's not nearly as hard. It's not nearly as scary. The story is not as good. But, you know, you just swim around and craft undersea bases, and it's pretty and stuff like that. So, um, uh, I, I give it a positive review simply because, like, um, you know what you're getting into, right? Like, if you if you played Subnautica 1 and you liked it a lot, like I did, um, you gotta play Subnautica 2. Like, it's just more of a deep ocean bundle. What is this? Uh, oh, it's just both of them. <laughs> at zero discount. <laughs> you can buy them individually for 30 or together for 60. Oh, okay. Well, thanks. <laughs> uh, so Subnautica 1 is still 30 bucks. Wow. For a game that came out four years ago. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it took me 45 hours to beat it and that was with a lot of me kind of screwing around too. Uh, Subnautica... Uh, Subnautica 2 has perhaps some inflated hours because I just let my daughter sit around and swim around and craft a base and things like that too. So, anyhow. Um, yeah, let me use Subnautica as an example of um, as an example of how I'm going to analyze a game. Okay. So, uh, Subnautica probably is about 30 hours to beat and about the same for the for the sequel. It's not a very long game, but 
it's kind of sandboxy, so like a lot of people just spend a long time building these giant undersea bases and things like that. It's a it's a crafting survival game. So it but underwater. So you have scuba gear and stuff like that. Um, okay. So game analysis form. So we're going to talk about the principles of game design. All right. And uh, there's more than this. This is these are just kind of the most important ones. And so what you're going to do for your next homework assignment is you're going to download, play Relecta, and then you're going to uh, fill out this form. Okay. And uh, you're gonna... hello. There you go. Um, type in your name. Type in your student ID. Uh, if you have partners, which you won't have for this one, it's a single player game. Name of the game would be Relicta. Uh, how many minutes did you play it? I want you to play it for at least. For at least two hours, I would say. I'd say one hour is probably more fair to you, but I think for you to be fair to the game, two hours is probably good. So, your homework assignment is to play a game, a video game, for two hours. So is that except for 58 people, 50 B people, you gotta you gotta follow the, in the footsteps of 343 Studios. Are you gonna do a multiplayer game? That'd be really fun. Yeah, yeah, probably. Um, like we did a uh, war game Red Dragon. That was that was, I, I can give a whole talk on that game. But um, yeah, yeah, we'll do we'll do multiplayer games for sure. So I want you guys to play for 120 minutes. You guys all understand? This is this is serious college homework, guys. You have to play a video game. All right. Don't disappoint your professor. Don't slack off and play video games. We should be playing video games. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got to you got to buckle down. You got to do your homework, okay? Play 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 video games instead of video games. All right. So genre, uh, it's probably like a puzzle game, I think, like maybe a first person. I haven't actually played it yet. Uh, how many players? I think it's single player. I'm not I haven't played it yet. And then you're going to answer these questions. How fun was it? This is obviously subjective. I'm not going to mark you down if you hate it, you know, or whatever. Um, I, I do, however, not give... Uh, I do, however, not give full points if you get some of these answers wrong. Like, if you if you tell me that chess is a luck-based game, like, I'll be like, nope, he didn't play that game. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there is no luck in chess, right? You know what I mean? So fun is subjective. Like, I'm, I'm just curious what you think of the game. Was it fun or not? Is it cooperative or competitive? Now, for a single-player game, it's just purely competitive, I think, because you're trying to beat the game. But like, um, uh, but for um, you know, like a game like Team Fortress, it's both cooperative and competitive. So I'd, I'd put it like at a three, right? Because it's it's competitive between teams and it's cooperative among people. And then some games like a, a Across the Obelisk are purely cooperative. Right, so if you, uh, because uh, it, it more applies to multiplayer, right? Because you're multiple people working together against um, the enemy. Um, 14,000 hours in Warframe, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, is Destiny luck or strategy based? What do, you, what do you think? What do you guys think? Both? How is it luck based? Which which element which element of Destiny Two has the most luck in it? The loot, yeah, yeah. So um, it, it's a it's a looter shooter. It randomly generates loot for you. Um, Hundred percent luck. Ten percent complaining about luck. <laughs> yeah. Um, but when you actually have your stuff and you're playing the game, like when you're doing a raid, um, it's mostly skill. You know what I mean, right? It's hundred percent luck when you do a when you do a raid, like you just flip a coin to win or not. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, oh, oh, LFGs, yeah, that's fair. But okay, I, I don't know if I'd call that luck. I, I mean, I guess, I guess maybe. All right. Um, so for Subnautica, let me pull that up again. Um, for Subnautica, it's a single player game. So it's purely competitive. It's just you versus the world. And um, how much luck is there in it? None, basically. Uh, I guess there's monsters in the world, but they're in fixed locations. And, and so, like, if you know what you're doing, you could just very quickly go through and perfect the game. You know, like, if you know what you're doing, you could probably clear the whole game and, I don't know, like, not even talking about speed running, but just, like, 
going through the content as quickly as possible, probably 10 or 15 hours, like you knew exactly where to go and what to pick up and what to craft. Um, Subnautica 2 went very quickly for me because it's the same game, right? And so I'm like, okay, well, I need to make a knife. So I'm going to go over here and get this stuff, and I'm going to go here and pick those those creep vine clusters and then turn that into, into lubricant, and then I'm going to cut these with my knife and get synthetic fibers and use that to craft this. And I'm just like, bloop, 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 tech up, tech up, tech up, tech up, you know? And um, yeah, so Subnautica is purely a, purely a skill-based game. There's there's really no, no randomness in it, no luck in it. Um, we can have a whole discussion over how much luck you should have in a game, but right now I'm just going to explain what these things mean. How much player interaction is there in a, in a single player game? It's just going to be low. It's going to be one. But like for a game of like um, League of Legends or uh, Destiny 2, like you're constantly interacting with other players, right? You're interacting with your team. Not as much if you're like jungling or whatever. You're like going off on your own and, you know, doing that. But uh, it, how much how much does your... What player interaction means is how much does what you do impact the play experience of other people? Okay. So in a board game, I have some board games where there's almost no player interaction, right? You, uh, you, you're you so like, uh, there's a, a game called, not Subnautica, it's called Suburbia, where you're building a, a, a city. And basically there's a bunch of tiles, and when it's your turn, you take a tile and add it to your city and score points. And then the next person takes a tile and adds it to their city and scores points. And so there's nothing you can do to the enemy cities. You can't send Godzilla at them, you can't destroy them. Um, there's basically no player interaction. The only interaction possible is that I might take a tile that somebody else might want, but then the tiles kind of slide down and maybe they get a tile they want anyway. That's literally the only... So, like, if somebody's winning, you know, like, there's not really a whole lot you can do about it. You know, like, oh, I, I bet he's going to try and take that airport, so I'm going to take the airport first. That's about it. Uh, and then they'll just probably take something else and score points anyway. Uh, maybe not as... Is meaningful, but um, yeah, for some for Subnautica for Suburbia, I would I would put on the low end one or two on player interaction. Uh, Destiny two, um, if you're playing as like a tank or a wizard or whatever it's called, the warlock or titan or whatever, um, you know, there's more player interaction, right? Because you're healing your teammates, you're shielding them, you know, whatever. So, um, but I would say Destiny two, League of Legends have pretty high uh no you don't heal your teammates no you don't do that <laughs> overwatch would be a five yeah it, overwatch has a huge like if you if you try like i guess you can play as like genji or something you know or hanzo and just go hide in a you know tower somewhere and shoot people with arrows i, I guess but in general um in general like in overwatch yeah you work as a team together you know, you got you got your dude with the big shield, and you got, you know, Mercy, and you know who's the complete ripoff of the Team Fortress Two medic, ah. uh, right? Um, right. So there's a lot of player interaction because your 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 decisions are constantly influencing that of other people. Uh, in a single player game, that'd just be one. Uh, how much downtime is there? So that's downtime is the concept of how long are you sitting around waiting for something to happen. And in general, that's a bad thing. Most of these things, uh, there's not exactly a good, like a correct number. Like for some games, they need to be a little more luck based. You know, like a looter shooter would be quite boring if you could just click and choose your item. You know what I mean? You kill a monster. Which which item do you want? That one. Thank you very much. Right? Do you guys, do you guys agree? Like Destiny Two would be a much shorter game if uh, you could just be like ah click thank you and then you don't need to play the game again all right so uh um so there's not like a right or wrong answer for luck um most of the time you're just waiting for five of your dumb friends to decide what they want to do yeah. so downtime yeah okay so downtime i guess there is downtime then if you're just waiting around like all right let's do this now let's do this then yeah there would there would be there would be downtime um uh, in a game like chess, though, even when it's not your turn, you're always thinking, right? So a game like chess doesn't have downtime, 
Unless, like, you know what you're going to do, and you've won, and you're just, like, waiting for them to, to realize this or something. Like, in chess, even though it's not your turn, you're still actively burning your brain cells, like, studying the board position and things like that. Um, it's even better when it's not your turn, because uh, if you're playing clock chess, right, the time's ticking down on you, and you're feeling the pressure of, like, ah, I'm running out of time, you know. Whereas when it's their turn, you can, you can study the board, you know, freely without that kind of time pressure on you, so... Um, uh, how easy is how easy is the game to learn? How easy is Destiny Two to learn? Like if somebody like if uh, you got a friend and they're like, "Hey, I want to play Destiny Two. Can you teach it to me?" Like how long does it take to like pick up? You know, easy. Yeah, I would say so. And the game itself, um, the game itself is structured so that you start off with very few powers, right? And then as time goes on. Like, you get more powers. Is that is that an accurate statement, right? Like, you start off not even having, like, your subclass, right? Is, is, is that still how it is? Like, you start off as just, like, a basic titan, and then you go to, like, level 10, and then at level 10... Oh, they got rid of that? Okay. Um, so, in the base game? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So, the, the, the game that I played, at least, was structured so that it sort of taught you the powers one at a time and um, and it kind of walked you through it so it was very easy to learn. It didn't just throw you into like um, the deep end. Uh, Path of Exile is a, a Diablo 2 style game that has um, Has anyone here played Path of Exile before? Just You played it, you've heard of it. You the tree. Okay. So when you play Path of Exile, you when you, your class only choose your the only thing that matters for your class in Path of Exile, like whether you're a, a witch or a barbarian or whatever, all that matters is where you start. Okay? And so like if you're this class, you know, whatever, you start here. And another class will start like down here or whatever. That's the only difference. Every time you level up, you get to pick one thing on... This is the witch class, I guess. Let's see. Let's play as, like, the Marauder. There we go. So the Marauder starts over here. Okay, so let's say you level up. You get a skill point. And you can choose either to put it into armor and life to become more tanky, or you can choose to put it into melee damage and life to become more offensive -y. Okay? And so the game... Is structured in such a way you don't have to look at the entire skill tree although obviously when you get good at the game you do because you have to, like when you get into builds uh, it gets really really complicated but the game is structured so that it's easy to learn you level up do you want to have more health and armor or do you want to have more health and damage You're like okay I'll take that one and then it unlocks two things and you can choose either to get more strength which allows you to wear heavier armor and do a little more damage or you just go flat damage I'm gonna take damage okay more damage. And then I can choose either attack speed or more damage. I'm going to take attack speed. And then more damage. And then I get to my first notable. Born to fight. 4% attack speed and strength and physical damage. That's a great one. I'm going to take that. Now I get to choose. Do you see how it starts progressively unlocking? By this point, I've been playing the game for like, I don't know, half an hour or so. Now I get to choose whether I want to go up this way and maybe head towards eternal youth, where you get less life regeneration and less life recovery per second from leech, but my energy shield recharges my life instead of energy shield, which is a very fast regeneration indeed if you have that. Or I can go down this way. Green is uh, kind of like dexterity things. Blue is like magic things and red is like strength things. And so they're kind of color coded to let you know what you're going for. I'm just gonna go pure barbarian rage. I want more life. I want life, life and strength. I want life. And then my next notable, I regenerate, yay, and strength. And then maybe I'll go this way. You see how it, and if I start zooming out, you can see these are all the options I have now. And then if I start going up this way, you can see just how many options you can get through. This is like, uh, I don't know, level 20 or 30 or so at this point. The game goes up to level 100. 
I don't know if you can see quite how big the skill tree is. It is a very big skill tree. And you can add things to the skill tree. You can get items that modify the skill tree and things like that. There's like a thousand different nodes on it. Okay. So how easy is it to learn? It's structured in such a way that uh, they structured in such a way that um, they make it as easy as possible to learn, but I would still put it somewhere in the middle, right? Because that skill tree is colossal in size. And once you've played it once, the first time you make a character, it's going to be terrible. Just delete it. Just throw it away. It's going to be terrible. <coughs> You're going to make mistakes. And then you start getting into like, <clears throat> all right, I'll just copy somebody's build. You know, somebody else has figured out the right things to do, and I copy it, and then I then you kind of get annoyed because the items you get don't match what they need for the build, and you're like, uh, uh, and, and then you either have to go onto the auction house and purchase the right items or farm to get currency to get the right items. And th then when you really get into it, you start making your own builds, you know? And so it's very hard to master, but it's very easy to kind of get into. So uh, Path of Exile, I think, does it right. How much information do they have about the game state? In a game like chess, you have full information, right? You can see everything in the game state. Uh, in a game like StarCraft or, um, you know, Guild Wars, um, you can't see everything in the world, right? There's a fog of war, so you have partial information. Like, you know, some things in the world, you don't know others. Like in Texas Hold'em, right? You know your hand, you know the face-up cards in the middle of the deck, you don't know what's in other people's hands, so you have partial information. Texas Hold'em would be a very boring game if everybody could see everyone's cards, right? No, Bob wins, <laughs> you know? Chess would be a very dumb game if there was hidden information, right? I've seen people play that before, like you put a divider down the center of the thing or whatever. Um, little information, I'm, I'm not talking about lore, I'm talking about like, are you aware of the health of the monsters in Diablo 2? Or every time I see D2, I think Diablo 2, in Destiny 2? Are you aware of the health of the monsters? Do you know their attacks? Do you know their resistances? Do you know uh, the, the different phases they go through when you're doing a raid? Yes or no? When a new expansion comes out? Nobody know, in Destiny 2 knows the, exa the exact amount of health anything has. Okay. Do you know when a monster is getting close to dying? visual cues yeah so you have partial information uh is the game abstract or simulationist so a simulationist game would be like europa Uni europa universalis 4 where it's trying to simulate europe and it will simulate the whole world every country in the world an abstract game would be a game like um azul so uh it's a no 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 what no There we go. A game like this. So this is Azul. It's a game. It's a board game. It's a fun game. It's actually quite fun. And um, it, theoretically, you're like constructing a stained glass window, though that has nothing to do with anything. And uh, and so um, basically, uh, it's completely abstract. Like it, you're, you're you're just taking tiles from these from these things and when you take one you put the other ones on the other ones and one in the middle and like it's um a completely abstract game kind of think of like tic-tac-toe like tic-tac-toe doesn't simulate europe it's just x's and o's on a board you know um go you know you're just putting stones on a board it's a very abstract game um does it have a low or high skill cap like can you get good at destiny 2 or do you just like hit the do you hit the skill cap pretty quickly? Like, if you were to if you were to like give me your account, uh, if you were to give me your account, um, Alex, would I be able to play as well as you on the rating in Destiny Two? What do you think? You can't. I, I'm not talking about actually doing it. I'm just saying. Hypothetically, if I sat down in front of your computer, so so Bungie would not know that I am playing as you, uh, and I sat down and I and I you know you know you teach me the controls like WASD and clicking and things like that. 
would I be able to do uh, one of the one of the raids in in Destiny Two? It would take a little bit of time to learn the mechanics. Art, how long? Like, how many hours would it take me to get to a point where I could, you know, because I'm obviously not going to grind to the light level, whatever. Um, not long. I know basic arithmetic. <laughs> Yeah, so then, you know, maybe Destiny 2 has, like, a lowish skill cap, right? Like, you can you can get good at it reasonably quickly. Whereas a game like chess has a very high skill cap. You play for your whole life, and you still haven't mastered chess. Like, you might not ever become a chess master, let alone a grandmaster, let alone an international grandmaster, let alone be, you know, the best in the world. What about tic-tac-toe? How, how long does it take to get good at tic-tac-toe? Within an hour? Okay, yeah, so low skill cap then. Uh, how long does it take good to get good at tic-tac-toe? I used to beat my daughter at tic-tac-toe all the time. So it took her a while, but you know, you're talking about like a four-year-old. So what, how long would you say it takes to, to learn tic-tac-toe? Like if you've never seen tic-tac-toe before, how long would it take to, uh, to like figure it out? What do you think? Two minutes? Okay. Would it? I mean, you, you kind of have to play it a few times, you know, until you figure out, like, oh, this game sucks. Like, you can't win. 60 seconds? Yeah. I, you're, I mean, you're saying that because you've played it before. But, like, if you had never played Tic-Tac-Toe before, yeah, it may be five minutes. Yeah, I think Meredith has it. Like, yeah. You, you run through a few games, and after a while, like, you figure out the strategy. Like, don't take one of the side middle pieces or you're going to lose, you know. Um, maybe start in the center or start in the corner or one of those. Uh, yeah, and then you figure it out. And then you have it mastered. Right? There are no international tic-tac-toe championships, I hope. Right? It's got a low skill cap. Um, how does it ha how well does it handle players of different skill levels? Ooh, this is an interesting question. What happens if you pit a the world's best tic-tac-toe player against a medium tic-tac-toe player? Well, they're still going to draw. You know what I mean? Like, so tic-tac-toe actually handles people of different skill levels really well. It's one of the reasons why we play it with kids. You know? Uh, because kids are generally kind of dumb, you know, especially if you're talking like really young kids, you know, they're kind of, they don't really have all the cognitive facilities yet. And so you can actually play tic-tac-toe with, them, you know, and have, have fun with it, you know? So, uh, how well does, how well does Guild Wars 2 handle people of different skill levels, Meredith? If you have somebody in your guild who, who kind of, kind of sucks, you know, how much does that drag you down, drag your team down? How much does having a, a dumb player in Destiny 2 drag you down? If you get a random looking for group in in a raid, how much how much do they drag you down? Can you win without them? It can ruin the raid. Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Depends on cumulative specs. Some legendaries can carry the whole group. Yeah. Yeah, so, so if, if a game is well designed, like, you can actually have some people in your group that are better and some that are worse, and it kind of, kind of you know, handle it, right? Whereas in a lot of competitive games, um, especially like esports games, like, better players will just crush people that are worse. Like, I played Halo Infinite after having not played Halo for a long time. I played the MCC a little bit, uh, but um, having not played Halo since, like, Reach, you know, 12 years ago. Uh, I was like, what the hell is happening? Because I used to think I was good at Halo, and I'm just, like, walking around, just, like, getting capped left and right, and I'm just like, I'm just going to stand on the flag and just capture these control points, and I don't care that I'm going to die because I'm just going to walk back and find an open one and sit on it and just contribute to the team, even though my kill-to-death ratio will be, like, you know, horrible, right? I'm just going to sit on the flag because it's a team game. Like, it's a capture the control points game. I'm just going to sit here... And when people come down the corridor, I'm going to throw grenades and just kind of, you know, make them dock and, you know, I'm just going to sit here, you know, play the objective. I know, like, my kill to death ratio was terrible, but I'm like, you yeah, know, I was on the flag, so, you know, I, I did something. You know, and so that's that's one way that you can kind of handle different skills, right? Like in Team Fortress, you can have somebody play an engineer. Like, if you can't shoot straight, well, build a sentry gun and let it shoot for you, you know what I mean? And so because when I started playing Halo again, I was like, wow, I, I'm really garbage. Uh, I was just like, I would just sit on a control point and when somebody would come up to attack me, I would just like hide behind the pillar, you know, and just play this like 
you know, game of like keep away, you know, and I'm I'm just doing everything I can to just keep the the thing and eventually they would kill me, right? But you know, I'm doing everything I can to get points for the team, right? So um Kearney's actually good at the game. I'm not um <laughs> Uh, partly it's because, you know, I was, uh, you played with me. Yeah, you played with me. I was playing with uh, Hike, who's like uh, ranked Diamond League or whatever the, the hell the next below Master is or whatever. And so I was getting, I was getting match made with like um, his caliber people. And uh, I was just like, what the hell is that? Because like I was playing with my friend Nate and Nate, Nate's better than me. And I was kind of sucking because, like, I was getting match made with, like, his level people and I was just kind of, like, losing kind of a little bit. Um, and then I played, they were like, oh, Hike's online, let's play with Hike. And then I'm just like, what the hell is happening here? Like, all these, like, people are just like, like, you know, I'm just dying from every angle and I'm just like, ah, you know. But, you know, because because the game has, like, you know, this capture the capture the control point mechanic, like, I was, I was able to con contribute, you know, uh, and he posted the meme of, like, the giant, like, patting the head of, like, the little boy, you know, kind of thing. Like, yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, <laughs> grapple hook, no scope. I don't even know what was happening, dude. I was just, I was getting shot from every angle. It was, it was baffling to me what was happening. Um, I, I yeah, I'm not interested in, in Destiny 2. Sorry, sorry, Alex. Uh, is it dexterity or intelligence based? Dexterity means, like, it requires twitch and coordination. Like, Halo requires a fair bit of dexterity, right? Like, you have to, you know, be able to put a cursor on the p person. You know what I mean? Like, people are running around, and you have to be able to keep the crosshair on the person, ideally on their head, right? And shoot them. If you can shoot them in the head every time, like, you're, you're probably going to win, right? Across the map, no scope, headshot, you know, like, you're going to win. So there is a lot of dexterity in Halo, uh, but there is intelligence as well. And uh, and that's, you know, like I was saying, like, I'm... I'm just like running the clock down. I got, I got a capture point. There's a corridor. I'll just throw a grenade and they duck back around, you know, throw another grenade, fire wildly at them, you know, you know, hide, play hide and seek to try and keep the control point, you know. So, you know, I would say there is a, a fair bit of, a uh, fair bit of uh, intelligence. It, it, not a whole lot. I would say dexterity is probably tops. How balanced is it? So balance is the notion that not there's no option that is so terrible you would never take it, and there's no option there is that is so good you would always take it. Do you guys hear that? Balance. The Kearney principle of balance is that no option is so good you must always take it, and no option is so bad you must never take it. So in, uh, was it Valorant or something, like there was a gun that people were making fun of for being just terrible? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Um... What was the name of that gun? I, I know we're over time, too. Um, terrible Gun Valorant. Is that the one I'm thinking of? I never played Valorant. Worst Weapons in Valorant. <laughs> uh, two snipers to choose from. One kills with a single shot to the body. The other is the Marshal. Okay. That... Mm. I don't know. Um, yeah, but you'll you'll always hear people complaining about balance, right? Like some some options are just are just terrible. Some options are too good, and, and that's one of those things that really requires a fine touch, you know. Because sometimes, yeah, like just options are just so bad. Like people are like, why is that in there? And if it's an option, they just won't take it. And then maybe you like look at the uh, you look at the stats for your game. You're like, oh wow, nobody's buying the uh, the this pistol. Um, the weapons I could conjure and anyone could pick up. Nice. Um, what's an example of a game that's balanced? Well, uh, you know, StarCraft, StarCraft 2 are traditionally considered masterpieces in game balance, right? Um, that even though the three factions are very different, uh, they're still balanced somehow against each other. Um, and that took just like a lot of work, you know what I mean? A lot of different updates and versions and things like that as well. Um, Team Fortress, I would say, is actually balanced. Overwatch. Um, I don't want. I don't want to call it exactly balanced, but yeah, I mean, they did a, they did a fairly good job. It, balancing gets even harder when you're talking about teams, 
you know, and team compositions and, and things like that. Like, all right, what if we do the dive comp versus two tank, you know, and things like that. Like, it, it, it gets really hard to balance things properly. And typically what you'll see is that the players will really sit there and optimize and figure out the ideal composition for a team. And then that dominates, especially in a competitive environment, right? If it's cooperative where you're like raiding against enemies, it doesn't matter as much. Uh, although people will yell at you if you're not using the right raid spec or whatever. Um, but like, then the developers have to be like, all right, we don't want everybody picking the same thing every time. So different games have handled that in different ways. Like they'll do bans, right? Like in League of Legends, you can ban certain characters. And so they just are like, all right, if there's some characters that are too strong, then the people will just ban them, right? Like if the meta is like to always play as this character, then you just let the other team ban it and then they can't pick it, you know? And so that's one way you can go about balancing. So whatever the meta is, they can just counter the meta. Uh, Rainbow Six is banning, yeah. Um, Destiny Two balance sucks, yeah, and and that and that's that's true. Like sometimes, like there's just an option that if somebody's playing it, you're like, why are you, why are you doing that? Why are you playing that? That the other class does the same thing that class does, but better. You know, why are you, why, you know? So, um, trouble with balancing a team against people find the best thing, even if it's not the best. Then it just rotates to the best thing that whatever counters is the last best thing. Yeah, it, it, that's true, and and um, it, and that's actually a problem I think there is with Overwatch, which is that the design of Overwatch is to put together the best, most powerful team possible, and there's not really counterplay so much in in it. Uh, there is there is to a certain extent, but it, there's not really there's not really counterplay, and it, it's not designed that way. It's really designed for one team to go up against the, another and smash them and kill them, you know, and then capture the control point is really what it's about. If you look at a game like Age of Empires, though, Age of Empires is all about counterplay. So if somebody goes heavy on horses, you go, you go heavy on pikemen. If they go heavy on pikemen, you go heavy on champions. If they go heavy on champions, you go heavy on archers. If they go heavy on archers, you go heavy on cavalry and you're back to where you were before, you know. And so Age of Empires is very heavily based on scouting. You want to see what kind of army composition they're putting together today in this match, and then you build the counter to it. And so then you need to counter their scouts and, and so on and so forth. And so um, Age of Empires is a really well-designed game from a balance perspective. They've got like, I don't know, 40, 40 civilizations now, all with unique powers, and they're somehow balanced. Um, like if you went, look at their win rates, it, it, they, they're never more than like 45% to 55% win win rate in competitive play so um and 45 percent is is bad you know and so they'll tweak it and stuff like that but um the uh, uh it is it is really balanced game simply because the game mechanics itself are designed for counterplay and that's actually the approach i took when making custom team fortress which is the notion that um there is a counter to everything like in magic the gathering you can there's a counter spell so if somebody plays a spell, you can play a counter spell, and then you can counter the counter spell, and so on and so forth. In custom team fortress, if if sniper is the dominant meta, you can buy anti sniper armor and not die to snipers. Uh, you take half damage and no headshots, right? And uh, you know it's like in Pokemon. Pokemon has the same counter mechanics in it, where like if fire Pokemon are just somehow like they made a mistake and just fire Pokemon are just too good. You know what I mean? Like, let's say that they just made a mistake and one set comes out and fire Pokemon are just too good. Then what happens is that people play water Pokemon because water counters fire. They do double damage against it. And as long as, you know, it's not like more than twice as good, then water Pokemon will, you know, be able to counter fire. And so you can't just make an all fire deck because then people just play water and just, you know, wipe you out and stuff like that. So, so games like Pokemon um, actually have a good inherent balancing mechanism to them because in general and that's not always the case there have been cards and pokemon that don't really have a counter um it's like giratina or something like that uh that are just too good and just don't have a counter but by and large the mechanics itself are inherently self-balancing so games like uh, custom team fortress my game age of empires pokemon they have inherent balancing mechanisms in them so that if the meta is like okay We've done the math, and fire Pokemon are ten percent better than all their options. Well, just run a water Pokemon, you know. So, um, and then finally, uh, replayability. How how excited would you be to play this game again, a second time? 
right? Let's say you beat Relecta. How excited would you be to, to, to play it again? You know, and single player games often aren't very replayable, right? Like I loved Wrath of the Righteous. Uh, it has a small amount of replayability. I'd actually give it a three, which is better than um, than a lot of uh, single player games, simply because in Wrath of the Righteous there's branching storylines and there's bran there's different there's 140 classes you could play, and there's like seven or nine different archetypes, mythic paths you could play, and so like in one of the paths you just uh, have no friends and you play the whole game as a walking hive of insects so normally the game you have like all these npcs that are your friends you talk to and stuff like that nope they all leave you or you eat them or something i don't know and you're just a walking swarm of insects and you devour the world and you release more swarms of insects and you devour the entire world or you can play as a lich and most of your good friends leave you but you can like animate dead heroes and now you've got zombies that talk to you and stuff like that so Wrath of the Righteous has a certain amount of replayability to it. I, however, have no desire to play it again right now, at least, because I spent like 200 hours playing it. So um, I'd give it like a three. Uh, you've made like eight characters for Guild Wars. Yeah, yeah, same idea, right? So, you know, would it be exciting for you to make another character? And apparently the answer is yes, right? Um, Destiny 2, you know, same thing. Like there's 12 different classes you can play as, and so... Uh, Alex, have you played all twelve of the uh, of the classes in Destiny Two? Pata. Destiny One, you played all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Is it fun? Like, <laughs> you made all three. Is it fun to to like uh, play through it a second time with a different class? Warlock is fun. So that, that's a question of replayability. Like, how fun would it be to play through a second time? Right. Like, to experiment? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'd say so. And so having different classes and things like that does, does make it more fun. Um, Wrath of the Righteous has such a massive time uh, cost to it, though. Like, I just don't feel like playing another 200 hours just to have the novel experience of being a walking, you know, locust swarm. Yeah, so... Uh, Europa Universalis, though, is definitely, like, a very replayable... Um, very replayable game for me because you can always just play as a different country, right? So it covers all of um, the world. You can play as Ming if you want to have a very different experience. You can play as an Italian city-state. Um, so literally you can play every country in the world. <laughs> so that's a lot of replayability. And there's a lot of achievements in the game. I've only got a small fraction of the achievements in the game. And I've been hunting achievements. Like that's I play the game to get achievements, and um, I've got seventy-two out of three hundred thirty-four. So there's plenty of replayability, you know, left in in European Universalis. Okay, so uh, PvP is fun. There's Vanguard missions and Gambit. Yeah. Okay. So so that is the basics of game design principles. When you make your game, I want you to be thinking about these things. Like, hey, does my game have too much downtime? How easy is it to learn? Do I want to make an abstract game? Do I want to make a simulationist game? Am I supporting a high skill cap? A high skill cap is generally considered better than a low skill cap. Do I handle people of different skill levels well? How's my matchmaking Halo Infinite? Um, <laughs> you know, do I want this game to be Twitch or Thinky? You know, um, obviously you want your game to be about balance as balanced as possible without being boring. So these are all things you're going to be doing. You're going to be reviewing Relecta and... Um, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm editing the form, aren't I? Oops. Oh, well, let me undo these, maybe. There we go. <laughs> uh, there, it's all undid, undone. But you're going to play the game two hours, and then you're going to fill it out, and this will get your, your brain going on doing game analysis. So I want you all to do this by Thursday. I'll install it myself and play it by Thursday, and then on Thursday we'll talk about this. I have 50B people will come back at 4 o'clock, is it? What time do we come back? Three o'clock? Uh, I have office hours from... Oh no, it's still class. We're not over We're not over time yet. Nice. Uh, we have until 1.50. Uh, office hours from 2 to 3.30. Okay, so... Four o'clock. Yeah. Okay, so I-50B people will come back at four o'clock and we'll, we'll talk about stuff. 
um, how game engines work and things like that on the inside. Um, I have 50 A people play Relicta, fill out this form, I'll post the link on, on Canvas, and you have until Thursday to do that. So your homework assignment is to play video games. I hope you understand how amazing it is to be in this class because I don't know any other class that will make you deliberately play a video game as, as homework. Okay. You want to attend office hours? Okay, well, it's it's office hours now then, I guess. So hang out and I will I will answer your questions. If only you get to office hours, huh? Yeah, just send me a message. I'll answer your question whenever you go. All right, thanks for coming out, you guys. Hope you learned a little bit about ludology today, the basic principles of game design. And uh, yeah, and so when we come back on Thursday, we'll, I'll take a look at your responses and We'll see if we can kind of, kind of come to some sort of consensus on Relicta. I haven't played it yet. I hope it's good. All right. Peace out. It's funny to play about Destiny 2. Yeah. Yeah, it's a popular hobby in, in the gaming world, uh, complaining about our favorite games. <laughs> All right. See you.